All right. Good morning, everyone. Great to see you. What an absolutely, absolutely outstanding weekend. And it's great to be together in the house of the Lord, worshiping together. And man, was it just absolutely glorious just to sit down together today and just let God's name be glorified. Amen. Amen. Let's take our Bibles. Let's open to Romans chapter 8. <clears throat> we'll begin in verse 18. The title of our message Help is on the way. Let's pray. Father, we open our heart this morning. We want to receive from you through your word. Just speak into our lives. Transform us by your power. We pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. So Paul is writing, and he's writing to this church in Rome. He's been wanting to visit them <clears throat> for years uh, as he's been traveling on this missionary journey, he wants to get there to Rome so that he can, he can impart, he said, uh, spiritual gifts to them. Because he knows when you talk about spiritual gifts, you're talking about the Spirit. And he knows what they need. they need. They need the Holy Spirit poured out on them. They need revival. Because, you know, Paul's been there. He's done it. He's been on these missionary journeys now for years. He's seen the hardship. He's seen the trouble. He's seen the difficulty. And he has seen revival. And he knows that it is the Holy Spirit poured out on them that that's what they need. And he prays, oh, I want to go there. I want to import spiritual gifts to you. And uh, so this is a great thing for us because he understood the power of the gospel. He understood the power to transform lives. He'd been there. He'd done it. He'd seen revival. And, you know, speaking of missionaries and missionary journeys, uh, how's that for a segue? Uh, this last week, I was at a, a missions conference in Florida, and it was just absolutely wondrous to be inspired again just about the, the vision of, of uh, taking the gospel to the ends of the earth. I had the privilege of speaking on a pastor's panel, and it was just an absolutely great time. Uh, although, I have to tell you, uh, it was an interesting thing, right? I was so looking forward to going to Florida. I mean, it has been so rainy so cold, so long here in Oregon, I thought, I want to go to Florida, and I want to get some sunshine. And so what happened? What happened? The one time I go to Florida, it's like 85 degrees in Hillsborough. <laughs> I know, I know. It's like, I can't believe this. Uh, while I was there, someone gave me a great uh, humorous take on um, missionary dining. Have you ever heard this? Okay, so... The four stages of missionary dining. Stage one, missionary sits down to eat, and there's a fly in his plate of food. And so he throws the whole plate of food away out of disgust. That's stage one. Stage two, he sits down to eat, and there's a fly in his food, but he only removes the food immediately around the fly. Stage three, he sits down to eat, there's a fly in his food, and he eats the entire plate of food, of food, of food, I can say this, really, I can. He's going to eat the whole entire plate of food with the fly and enjoy it. Stage four, he sits down to eat. There is no fly, and he's disappointed. Okay. So there's the four stages of missionary giant. But let's go back to the, our story. So Paul wants to give spiritual gifts. He knows it's the power of the Spirit. They need this. Help is sent to them. Oh, you want to talk about suffering and difficulty. Oh, they're going to face it in Rome. And he knows what they need. You know, when Paul was on his second missionary journey, he went to Ephesus. And here is this major city, major center. And there was this handful of believers. And so he said to them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they said, no. We didn't even know whether there is a Holy Spirit. And then, of course, as we know the story, he prays for them. The Holy Spirit falls in power. And there's, a, I mean, a great revival busts out. Now today, certainly people have heard there's the Holy Spirit, but they have not experienced His power to transform their lives or to bring that spiritual victory that God desires. Because without the Holy Spirit, you could say there's no wind in the sails. There's no power in the life. And that's an important picture for us because many people today are in a place of what we might call spiritual doldrums. Doldrums is a real thing. And it is a, it is a place near the equator where um, because the trade winds blow one way in the north and a different way in the south, there's this area where there can be these doldrums. There is no wind. And if a sailing ship should enter into this area of doldrums where there is no wind, it can end absolutely disastrously. To have no wind as a sailing ship is to have no power. It's to go nowhere. 
And so this is an important illustration, an analogy, because the same is true for us spiritually. The Holy Spirit is the, the breath of God, the wind that is in our sails. In fact, in the Greek, the word for spirit is wind. And it is a very important understanding. In John 3, verse 8, Jesus says, The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from or where it is going. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. It is the Spirit that moves on hearts. It is the Spirit that sends forth power. See, wind is powerful. It's a great illustration. Wind can destroy a city. Wind can break trees like twigs. You know, this last uh, storm that we had, I mean, trees were broken all over, branches flying everywhere. And it's powerful. It can also be, of course, a, a power of good. It can generate power for a city. It can, it can move a ship across the ocean. And so in Jesus, and this is in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, Jesus said, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you will be witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and even the remotest parts of the earth. Because without the, the power of the Spirit, there is no wind in the sail. There's no power in the life. There's no transformation. And he knows that he needs it, that, that Rome needs it. In fact, when you get to Romans chapter 8, he's speaking to the fact that there is a lot of suffering in this world. There's a lot of trouble. There's a lot of difficulty. But help is on the way. He sends forth his Spirit. And let's read it together. Romans chapter 8, verse 18. I consider that the sufferings of this present time, oh, is this a world in which there is much suffering? He said, yes. And I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed to us. Do you know? He says, yeah, this is a world of trouble and sufferings, but do you know that there is a glory that God has in store for us that this world doesn't even compare to? And he goes on now. He's going to build a case. He's going to build layer by layer. He's going to build up to something grand here. He says, verse 19, the anxious longing of the creation itself waits eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God. And here's why. For the creation itself was subjected to futility, not of its own will, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself also will be set free from its slavery to corruption into the freedom of the glory of the children of God. Now, there's a lot in that verse right there. I love that phrase, into the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and suffers the pains of childbirth together until now. Creation itself is suffering. And not only this, we, we also ourselves, having the first fruits of the Spirit, we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our body. For in hope we've been saved. But hope that is seen is not hope. Why does one hope for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see with perseverance, Ah, oh, we wait eagerly for it. Oh, that glory. Oh, there is something better. We've tasted of the first fruits of the Spirit, but we know that there is something better than this broken down evil world. And we long, we long for that day. And then he continues on, verse 26, and in the same way, the Spirit helps our weakness. For we do not know how to pray as we should. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is because he intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. And then that brings us to the famous chapter 8, verse 28. For we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God to those who are called according to his purpose, for whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. And whom he predestined, these he called. And whom he called, these he justified. And whom he justified, these he glorified. 
And then that brings us to a capstone verse, verse 31. You might want to underline that, dog ear that page, and write it down somewhere. But make sure you write it on your heart, because it is a foundation of faith. It says, what shall we say to these things? Hey, if God is for us, you tell me who can be against us. And that is the substance of faith. Hey, help is on the way. There is suffering, there is trouble, there is difficulty, but he sends forth his spirit, he sends forth his power. There is wind in the sails. And he builds up to this in the verses before. He's helping us to understand that we have been adopted. Okay, God has adopted us so that uh, he is our Abba, Father. That's a Hebrew phrase. Uh, it's the most intimate way of, of speaking to your father, your dad, your papa. Your Abba. See, even an infant can say Abba. And it's an intimate way of calling out that he's your father who loves you. And the point being is that our father helps. Any good father is going to help his children. That's the point. He says, I want you to know, yeah, there's suffering, there's trial, there's trouble, there's difficulty. Help is on the way. Our father helps his children. Now, we raised five kids. We adopted a via that makes six. And I'll tell you, I want my kids to know that you're in trouble, you call dad. I mean, I'm for you. I'll be with you. Even if you mess up your life, I, I'm for you. I'll walk with you through it. See, how much more does God love us? See, I, 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 want, I want us to grasp the fact that even if we mess up, God wants us to call out to him because our father helps his children. And there is suffering, there is trouble, and there's trial. But help is on the way. And he's going to build this case now. He's going to build it up one layer at a time, and he's going to start with creation, which is very interesting. But he tells us, even for creation, help is on the way. See, notice this. Starting with John 14, Jesus says, I'm going to ask the Father. I'm going to ask the Father, and he's going to give you another helper. He's the help that God sends. He is the power. It's the wind in the sails that he may be with you forever. He is the spirit of truth. You know him because he abides with you and he's going to be in you. Help is on the way. And he builds his case layer by layer, starting with creation itself. It says, notice this, he says, the world itself is groaning. Groaning is part of suffering. And the creation itself, it says, groans and suffers the pains of childbirth until now. In other words, what he's saying is this. The condition of the earth itself is connected to the condition of man. And this we've got to grasp by going all the way back, to, all the way back to Adam, because it was subjected to futility brought under slavery of corruption. This goes all the way back to Adam. Notice that when God created man, he made man in his image. And part of the image of God is that man then would have authority. Let's go back to Genesis 1, verse 26. God then said, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness and let them rule over the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, the cattle, and over all the earth. So when Adam sinned, therefore, everything under his authority was affected by that sin. And that would include the earth itself. So notice in Genesis 3, when God is speaking to Adam in regards to the consequences of that sin, he said in Genesis 3, then to Adam he said, cursed is the ground because of you, because of that sin, because of what you did. Because both thorns and thistles, it shall grow for you until you return to the ground. In other words, until you die. For you are dust, and to dust you will return. Now there's a lot of beauty in this world. It's a lot of grandeur. You go down to the seashore at sunset, it is beautiful. Go to the, the, the forest, what grandeur. You know, the mountains, what majestic majesty, you know. Yeah, but there's also thorns and thistles and, and troubles and famines and earthquakes and tsunamis and hurricanes. And he says that they're, they're connected together to the, to the plight of man. The condition of man and earth are connected together. And even Jesus said that the signs of the times that indicate that we're entering into the end of the age, some of those will be seen in the earth itself. 
uh, Matthew 24, Jesus said, in various places there'll be famines, there'll be earthquakes, but all these things are merely the beginning of birth pangs. And Paul is telling us, creation is waiting eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God in hope that it will be set free from its corruption into the freedom of the glory of the children of God. In other words, even for the earth, help is on the way. Because as there is a future glory for a believer, as there is a future glory for those who hope in God, there is a future glory for the earth itself. Let me give you some verses. It's just very interesting. Isaiah 65, Behold, God says, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former things will not be remembered nor come to mind. Revelation 21, very famous. I saw a new heaven, a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth passed away, and there will no longer be any death. There will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. Oh, what a glorious day that will be. The first things have passed away. So he speaks first as he's building his case that creation itself has been subjected to the slavery of corruption, but help is on the way. And then he goes on to the next, speaking of us, verse 23, we groan also within ourselves. In this world that is so dark and evil and there's so much suffering, there's so much wrong, there's so much brokenness, help us on the way. I'm going to send you the Holy Spirit. And you're going to taste of the fruit of the Spirit, and you're going to have a taste of heaven. And it is a glorious hope and a glorious encouragement to you that help has been sent by God himself. Now we groan, looking for, because we, we know that we long for something better. We've tasted something better. We have the Holy Spirit. We, we, we long for something better. He says, so we groan within ourselves. Now, this is not the groaning that comes with growing old and your bones start creaking. I mean, we all know that that's just a natural part. You know what? You're growing till about 22, right? And then it's all downhill from there. And we all understand that. And by the way, interestingly, there is hope on the way also for these broken down bodies of ours. I don't know about you, but I'm really encouraged by that. We don't take these bodies with us. This is, he, he calls them a tent. A tent is just a temporary place to, to live. This is, you're just staying in this old body temporarily, and the older it gets, the more war-torn and wind-torn it gets, and it's just breaking down. But we have a glory in even getting glorified bodies. In 1 uh, Corinthians chapter 5, he says, we know that if the earthly tent, which is our house, is, is torn down, this body of ours, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For indeed, in this house we groan longing to be clothed with our dwelling from heaven. And we've tasted of the Spirit of God. Now, what does he say we've tasted? Because the Scripture tells us we have like the first portion, the first down payment, you might say. What is he telling us? He's telling us, hey, when we get to heaven in the presence of God, we are going to be filled and overflowing with the fullness of the Holy Spirit. I don't know about you, but that sounds like a glorious thing for me. We won't have these old broken down bodies anymore. We'll have glorified bodies and we'll be absolutely filled and overflowing with the presence of God in the Holy Spirit. And he says, have this hope in you. And then he says, next, he builds this out that the Spirit is groaning also, but the Spirit is groaning in our behalf. The Spirit helps our weakness. We don't even know how to pray like we should. And the Spirit is interceding, is praying in our behalf. And when He prays, when He intercedes, He prays according to the will of God, which is really helpful because when we pray, we oftentimes end up grumbling and complaining and whining to God. Ever done this in your prayers? I have. It's easy to start having an attitude because things are wrong. You know, God, why? How? And you start kind of complaining and you start grumbling and you're whining. I have this picture. I have this picture. Okay, so here's, you know, we're praying, and we're grumbling, and we, you know, we're kind of whining, and here's the Holy Spirit listening to all this and saying, you know what? I'll take it from here. Let me pray, because the Holy Spirit knows how to pray. We're over there grumbling. He says, listen, that's not how you pray to your Father. I know how to pray, and he begins to pray in our behalf, and there's this, I don't know about you, but I'm really encouraged by that. He's praying for us. He's praying. He is interceding for us. 
And, and the Holy Spirit knows the will of the Father. See, here's our problem. Our problem is that we, we only see dimly. We don't have the perspective of understanding what this means. But the Spirit does. The Spirit has the perspective of God. And so when we're, when we're praying, we're so limited, all we oftentimes see is the problem. All we oftentimes see is how difficult this thing is. But for God, there's a greater thing. God, there's a greater perspective. Oh, if we can only see, if we can only understand. See, 1 Corinthians 13 tells us, For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then we will see him face to face. I know now in part, but then I will know fully just as I have been fully known. Now, faith, hope, and love abide these three. But the greatest of these is love. See, this is the point. He's, he's bringing us to a point. Do you know how much God loves you? He sends forth his spirit who intercedes in your behalf, who witnesses to you that you're a child of God. He is with you in your suffering. He's with you in the trouble. And he brings us to this capstone verse of verse 28, and that God causes all things to work together for good, for those who love God, called according to his purpose. There's a great promise in this verse. Probably more plaques, cards, and art have been based on that verse than any other verse in the Bible, perhaps other than John 3.16. But there's great hope here, great promise here. Notice, though, in verse 28 what it does not say. It does not say in verse 28 that God causes all things. There's a lot of evil in this world. God does not cause evil. There's a lot of hurt and suffering. Now, some look at that and say, well, why does God even allow evil? I can't tell you how many times I've answered that question over the last three years. Why does he even allow evil? Many have thought that a God that's good should not even allow evil to exist. Now, there is a place where evil does not exist. Yeah, it's called heaven, and this ain't it. Here, now, he tells us, God made man in his image. And God made man in his image such that he gave him a will to freely choose to accept God or to reject God. Now, if somebody rejects God, they don't have God in his heart. They don't have God in his life. And if someone doesn't have God in his heart and someone doesn't have God in his life, what is he left with? He's left with the nature of man. And the nature of man is dark. The nature of man is evil. The nature of man is selfish. And the end result is a lot of suffering and a lot of evil and a lot of brokenness in this world because of the rejection of God. But help is on the way. I, I will send forth my spirit. I will be with you in the midst of the trouble. And here's what he's showing us. He's showing us is that God's will interfaces with human choice. You see the, the beautiful hand of God and the heart of God in such a way that God's will interfaces with human joy. It's a great promise in this verse. The Spirit is interceding and God is answering by working all things, all together for good. I, I have believed this verse and taken it to heart. It has encouraged me in, in tough times. When I received the Lord, I was 11 years old. I was living in a broken down, difficult home, uh, a lot of poverty. My father was an alcoholic. There was abuse. There was fighting. There was trouble. And I had yet this hope. I had yet this hope that God can use troubles, difficulties, trials, suffering. Somehow, somehow, God works all things together for good for those who love God and called according to his purpose. See, it requires faith. Faith works together with love. See, if you believe that God loves you, like, like Abba Father is for you and loves you, if you believe that he loves you, and if you believe that he is for you, verse 31, then you must also believe that your God is able to work all things together for good for those who love God and called according to his purpose. Faith is required when things we're talking about are not good. It's difficult to understand when things take a hard turn in life. Finances blow apart or doctor gives you bad news or someone near to you dies or a relationship is in, in shambles. But here's this promise. Here's this promise. God loves you as your Abba. That's a lot of love behind that word. 
He's a father who loves you, and your response is to receive that love and that belief that God is for you. The God who loves you is for you, and the God who loves you is going to work all things together for good for those who, are, who love God and call according to his purpose. And you then love him in return and love him extravagantly. Because it's when you love him, even in the midst of the suffering of the trial of the difficulty, that faith is strengthened and hope is encouraged. I was riding in the car and uh, Via was in the back. I was in the front. And she said, uh, Grandpa, do you want to hear a, a radio station? And I said, well, sure. So she said, okay, turn on the radio. So I did. Then she said, now turn off the radio. So I did. And then she said, you have now tuned into a Via Radio. <laughs> and uh, so she, she's got this whole thing down. And she said, uh, now the next song is by uh, Via Jones. And so she would just uh, make up a song. And she would make it up on the fly. Just whatever was on her heart, it would just come out as a song. And she would sing what I called beautiful honesty. Kids can be very honest. And she's just singing it. She's making it up. The next song is by Evie Jones. That's what she'd say. They woke me up that morning. And I thought, oh, here we go. <laughs> oh, that morning. They woke me up that morning. And I came downstairs. And they told me the worst news I have ever heard, that my mom is dead. And I cried. And it was very sad. And she's just singing this. And then she sings, but I have to remember that my mom's with Jesus. And that's a good thing. And then she repeated, but I have to remember that my mom's with Jesus. And that's a good thing. And then she keep going, I have to remember that God loves me and that he's with me. And I'm in the front going, oh my goodness, this is beautiful. And then she finishes, and that was Avia Jones. <laughs> now the next song is by Avia Jones also. <laughs> because all the songs on this station are by Avia Jones. <laughs> But I thought, you know what? She has captured something that many people have a hard time grasping. I have to remember that God loves me and that God is with me. Faith trusts him. And it comes out of receiving God's love and believing that God is for you. Even in the midst of the suffering and the difficulty and the trouble. If you could only understand, if you could only grasp how much God has for you. 1 Corinthians 2, verse 9, as it is written, things which eye has not seen, ear has not heard, which have not even entered the heart of man, all that God has prepared for those who love him. See, here's the point. Here's what he's telling you. God's purpose, he works all things together for good for those who are called who love God and called according to his purpose. What's God's purpose? God's purpose is to transform you. There's a, verses 29 and verse 30, there's a lot of debate about what the finer points of it mean, but I can summarize it this way. God knew you before you were born, and God determined in advance that those who love God will be conformed to the image of his son. God has a purpose, and he will transform the pain, and the suffering into the purpose of God. And let me give you a great verse. Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 5. And he's speaking to this Jeremiah, young man, and he says, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. And I have appointed you as a prophet to the nations. Now, that's a great verse for us. Maybe you have not been appointed as a prophet to the nations, but before you were born, God knew you. 
Before you were formed in your mother's womb, he, he consecrated you for a purpose. God works all things together for good. And he can take the pain and transform that pain into the purpose for which you were born. He can take the suffering and the trouble and the trial, and he can transform that into his purpose in your life. Our steadfast hope is believing. Man, if we could only see it. That's why Paul's prayer in Ephesians 1 is so powerful. He says, I, I pray that the eyes of your heart could be opened, that you would know the hope of his calling, that you could know the riches of the glory of his inheritance. What you have in, in, in God is amazing. Take hold of this great truth. Help is on the way. There's, there's people who walked in these doors today and there's no, there's no wind in your sails. And you're in spiritual doldrums. And there's nothing happening and you're, and you're just sitting there. See, the word of the Lord to you today is help is on the way. He sends forth the breath of God. He sends forth his spirit of life. Open your heart, he says. Open your heart. Help is on the way. Let's pray. Father, we are so blessed in understanding the greatness of your love. You are our Abba, Father. And Lord, I pray for everyone in this place today. that we would grasp just how much you love and that we would trust you completely and that we would love you extravagantly. Church, as we're praying, will you, do you believe, will you believe that God is able to take the pain or the trouble or the suffering and transform it into the purpose that God is moving in your life to accomplish? Will you trust him completely and will you love him extravagantly? Would you say yes to the Lord? Just raise your hand to the Lord. Raise your hand to God. Don't raise your hand to me. Raise your hand to the Lord and say, God, I want you to know I will trust you completely. I will love you extravagantly. I believe you are able. I believe you're able to transform. I trust you. I trust you. I trust you. And I'll love you. Father, thank you so much for touching us, for moving in power. We do thank you for that extravagant love, and we love you in return. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, can we give God praise and glory? Amen. 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 We're going to just worship. Let's stand to our feet.